Time to start a new unit. That new unit is going to be Heredity. You'll notice that the title on the screen here says Heredity 1, and that is because Heredity takes up such a lot of time, is such a large unit when it comes to our whole course that we're going to break it down into two smaller portions, Heredity 1, followed, of course, by Heredity 2. When dealing with the idea of heredity and starting at the very beginning, we need to begin with a man named Gregor Mendel. Prior to Mendel, there was no field of study of genetics. He was the beginning. Interestingly, he was a monk who lived in a monastery in Austria in the mid-1800s. He is known as the father of genetics because, as I said, he basically was its founder. He conducted some very famous experiments using pea plants that, although published, was never really uh, discovered until after his death. So although he's famous today, he never knew of his own fame. Pictured here would be the pea plant representation of his experiment. Before we actually get into the experiment, let's deal with some terminology first. There is what is called the P generation, which is wherever you start in a genetic study. P simply stands for parental. So here is our parental generation for Mendel's pea plants. Of course, those pea plants had parents as well, not pictured here, but we don't know anything about them. And you have to have a starting place. So whatever your starting place is in a genetic study, that's going to be your P generation. The P generation then has offspring and they are going to be called the F1 generation as pictured here in the middle of your screen. F1 simply stands for first filial generation. And F1 gives birth to F2 as pictured here. And if we had anything that followed, it would simply be F3, F4, and so on. Now let's look at the pictures here that represent the P and F1 and F2 generations of Mendel's experiments. Here's the basic gist of things. Mendel started off in his pea generation with a short pea plant and a tall pea plant. That was the genetic trait that he was studying, at least in this picture. He performed what is called cross-pollination on those original pea generation plants. In other words, he took pollen from one and fertilized the other and vice versa. And those plants then had offspring. Notice that the F1 generation, despite the fact that there is a short pea plant as one of the parents, everyone, all members of the F1 generation were in fact tall. Interesting as it is, Mendel then took one more step and he took members of that F1 generation and he cross-pollinated those amongst themselves and gave birth to the F2 generation, which very strangely ended up three quarters tall and one quarter short, or a three to one ratio from tall to short. And that basically was the end of Mendel's experiment. From that, he was able to develop three principles that today provide the foundation of the entire field of study of genetics. They are, as stated here, the principle of dominance, principle of segregation, and the principle of independent assortment. Now we can read that last one quickly. Independent assortment is different genes independently separate from one another when rep reproductive cells develop. We're going to come back to that at a later time. The real focus here today would be the first two, the principle of dominance and the principle of segregation. Let's start with the dominance. There are two versions of every gene and each organism inherits two copies of every gene. One version of the gene has the power to override the other. What does that mean? Let's look at the example here in these pictures. Although I just showed you Mendel's experiment with reference to the height of pea plants, that was not the only trait on which he did those experiments. He actually picked out seven traits. What was great and what worked out nicely for him is that all seven traits followed the exact same pattern of inheritance that I showed you with the height. There was always one version that showed up in the F1 generation and not the other. And the F2 generation always showed that three to one ratio or 75%, 25% breakdown. 
What he understood from that is that there were always two versions of every trait, and one of those versions was dominant, and that being the tall pea plant when it came to the height. And one of those versions was always what is called recessive. That would be the short. When mixed together, when a pea plant in inherits one gene for tall and one gene for short, the tall or dominant gene overpowers or overrides the recessive. And so that offspring would be tall. It would not be medium. It would not be a blend of the two. Instead, one version overpowers the other. So if a pea plant has two genes for tall, it's gonna be tall. If a pea plant has two genes for being short, it's of course gonna be short. But when a pea plant inherits one tall and one short, it's going to be tall. It's not gonna be a blend. The dominant, the tall, overpowers the short. And the same was true for these other six traits that you see here. Of all of the different versions that you see, one of those versions is the dominant, and one of those versions is the recessive, just like tall is dominant over the short recessive. The second principle, the principle of segregation, states that each individual has two copies of a gene per trait. Of those two copies, each person only passes on one. So let's think about that with this picture. And this principle is actually one that should make perfect sense to you having just learned about cell division and specifically about meiosis. What you're looking at here would be a homologous pair of chromosomes. And on that homologous pair, you can see one gene represented. Here is one gene and here is one gene and they are homologous. Each individual has two genes per trait. Here they are. These two genes deal with just one trait. You can think of it if you want to as the height of a pea plant. Notice that there is a capital letter A here. Capital letters are going to represent the dominant form of the trait and the lowercase letters are going to represent the recessive form of the trait. So in this case, this would be a tall pea plant. Even though it has a gene for short, it also has a gene for tall, and of course the tall is dominant. So this will be a tall pea plant. But what happens when this pea plant becomes a parent? They have to pass on their genes, but they can only pass on one. They can't pass on both. And so the arrows here represent anaphase one of meiosis one. This homologous pair will be lined up across from each other during metaphase one. A spindle fiber from one end of the cell will attach here. A spindle fiber from the other end of the cell will attach here, and they will get pulled in opposite directions and ultimately will end up in different sex cells, sperm or egg, whichever it may be. But this one will end up in one sex cell and this one will end up in a different sex cell and therefore only one can get passed on from that parent because one is going to get passed on from the other parent as well. And so that is the principle of segregation. So if you take the principle of dominance and the principle of segregation and apply them back to Mendel's initial experiment, here's the same picture that we looked, about, looked at earlier. Think about how all this plays into things. Here's our pea generation. Here's our short pea plant and our tall. The short pea, pea plant is short because it has two genes for being short. And the tall pea plant is tall because it has two genes for being tall. But remember, they can only each pass on one gene. So this one passes on one gene for being short. And this one passes on one gene for being tall. And here's one of the children, a gene for short and a gene for tall. But what does it look like? It looks tall. Why? Because the tall is dominant and it overpowers the presence of the short. 
the short is still there. It's still in this plant, but that plant is tall because it has that one tall gene, which is dominant, and the short is recessive. Then we cross this one with another one from its same generation, same combination of genes, and we end up with this 75%, 25%, or three to one ratio that you see down here. Well, why? Same rules. This plant can only pass on one. Let's say it passes on, uh, let's say it passes on this tall gene. And let's say this one just passes on the tall gene. And we end up with a gene for tall and a gene for tall. It's possible that this one passes on a short and this one passes on a tall, in which case you get this. It's possible that this one passes on the short and this one passes on the tall, in which case you get this. And all three of these are tall because they all possess at least one dominant gene for being tall. The only other combination that's left is a gene for being short and a gene for being short, which gives you this, and that's the one short pea plant because it has no other options. It only has genes for being short. So hopefully that picture represents to you the ideas of the principle of dominance, as well as the principle of segregation. And as I said, we will come back to the principle of independent assortment at a different time.